It thrills my soul to hear the songs of praise we mortals sing below. And though it takes the parting of the ways, yet I must onward go. Good evening, and welcome to the PM Sunday services of the Northfield Church of Christ for Sunday, September the 13th. We will sing four songs. I have two prayers, and I will deliver a message to you that I just hope will be helpful that you can carry with you through the evening and maybe through part of the week uh, and give you some things to think about and perhaps a challenge or two. And so, if you would please, if you are uh, following along and singing with us, uh, I am singing from the Songs of Faith and Praise uh, hymn book that we use in our church at Northfield. Perhaps you have a song book of your own. We will sing first hymn number 136. 136. The title of this song is Love for All. Okay, is everybody ready? Love for all, and can it be? Can I open this for me? I who strayed so long ago, strayed so far. child when they were passionate and wild I who left my father's home in forbidden ways to Turn your books, please, to number 722. 722. The title of this song is Let the Beauty of Jesus Be Seen. 722. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. All is wonderful passion and purity. May his spirit divine all my being refine. Let 
Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. When somebody has been so unkind to you, some words spoken that pierces you through and through, how he was reviled, spat upon and reviled. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in you. From the dawn of the morning to close of day, in deeds and in all you say. Lay your gifts at his feet, ever strive to keep sweet. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in you. The next song is number 238. Two thirty-eight. You are the song that I sing. <clears throat> you are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody, you are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords, you are the mighty God, you are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the songs that you gave to me. You are the song that I sing. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords, you are the mighty God, you are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the songs that you gave to me, you are the song that I sing. Let's all pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful for a time that... Uh, uh, we can just take a, a few moments out of a day and dedicate them to you. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would accept these songs of praise for just what they are, songs of praise to our wonderful God and our Creator. I thank you so much, dear Heavenly Father, for the many blessings of life, the blessings that are innumerable. I uh, just pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would just continue to be with us day by day and in these trying times that uh, we will find uh, new ways to get uh, closer to you and closer to one another. We know that there is unrest in the world. We know that we have uh, folks that uh, need our prayers. Uh, we pray, dear Heavenly Father, that uh, all of us will look into our bulletins or perhaps go to our website or Facebook page and uh, find out who they are and keep those people uh, on our hearts and in our prayers. Be with us through the rest of this service, dear Heavenly Father. Continue to enlighten us day by day as we turn to your word for guidance. We pray this prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And the song uh, before the lesson is just one page over, number 239. 239. It's entitled, 
in moments like these. In moments like these, I sing out a song, I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my voice, I lift up my voice to the Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord, I love you. In moments like these, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my hands. I lift up my hands to the Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord, I love you. All right. I hope the Lord enjoyed our song service and our praise to him. This evening, uh, I want to, uh, to preach a sermon about a sermon. <laughs> uh, I've been in the, I don't know if you want to call it a business, I've been in the sermon preaching business for somewhere near 50 years. I have to admit that preachers can be scoundrels sometimes. Uh, they will beg, borrow, and steal things. They will listen to other messages uh, and <laughs> sometimes call them their own. Uh, they will find outlines, and when they do flesh out uh, lessons, uh, they are such that uh, sometimes they are part of uh, their own thought and part of thoughts of others. And of course, one thing that we do have to remember uh, about sermons that we listen to is that uh, this has been going on for years and years and years. And so if you were there this morning, I let everyone know, and I believe it is in our bulletin, that the lesson this evening will be about the Sermon on the Mount. Christians and non-Christians alike throughout the world recognize Jesus' Sermon on the Mount as perhaps the greatest sermon ever preached. Luke's Gospel mentions the sermon in Luke chapter 6, verses 20 to 38. But when you really want to get the full flavor of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, you must turn to the Gospel of Matthew. And the Sermon on the Mount is, fine, is found from chapters 5 through 7. And uh, we presume that uh, uh, we have probably read it all, whether we've read it as a complete sermon, whether we've studied bits or pieces of it. I can't even imagine how many sermons that I've preached that had verses from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Just to give us a little background, and you'll get a little uh, history lesson here, most of Jesus' preaching uh, was done in the northern country, which is known as the region of Galilee. And it seems that this is where Jesus was and where he went when he preached this sermon. And to tell you the truth, the exact location of where the sermon was preached is sometimes a guess. We have surmised, because of the background material, that it was in the northwest region of the Sea of Galilee on a grassy hill known as Karn Hitten, near the city of Capernaum. 
Now, the sea is, I guess what we would say, surrounded by mountains. And <laughs> understand, these aren't the Alps or the Himalayas or the Rockies. These are not very tall mountains. And what we do need to remember is that the Sea of Galilee itself is 600 feet below sea level. Now, we come to uh, September the 13th, 2020. In our uh, church at Northfield, and in literally probably thousands of churches around the world, people are now carrying on something that's called live streaming. We've started doing that at Northfield, and we've been doing it for a couple of months. It's pretty exciting. Before we were meeting together in the building, and before we live streamed, uh, I recorded a message here at home, like this one is being recorded, and we put it on YouTube. And they are all available to you. Uh, sermons from, I guess, from March and April. Now, Jesus didn't have live streaming. <laughs> he didn't have microphones. He didn't have uh, uh, speakers. He didn't have amps. And so, to reach a very large crowd, do you suppose that Jesus was shouting at the top of his lungs to get his message across? Well, the answer is no. And if we have the configuration of where Jesus was at the time, the region around the Sea of Galilee is shaped something like a bowl. And a firm voice spoken downwind can carry a great distance. For those of you who go out in the water in a boat, you know that because of the nature of the water, uh, voices and sounds travel uh, great distances. And so a firm voice spoken with, I guess, firmness will carry a pretty fair distance. So when Jesus preached on a mountain near the Sea of Galilee at a crowd seated below him, the uh, wind was likely blowing in the correct direction. And when Jesus even preached from a boat facing uh, the shore, the wind was likely coming off of the water and toward the people. And they were able to hear him without Jesus shouting and without even uh, needing an amplifier or uh, needing an amp, uh, needing a, a microphone. All right, you have your history lesson. And so let's get into, if we would, the Sermon on the Mount. This is not going to be a detailed sermon about the Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to pick out some points, and I'm even going to challenge you uh, this evening. The key verse I think, in the sermon, is found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, where Jesus says, For I say unto you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Wow, that's some heavy-duty stuff, isn't it? Later, Jesus uh, I guess, kind of described these people. If he was going to say, don't be like them, he described them in Matthew uh, 15, 8 to 9. He said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines, get this, the precepts of men. Now, if we fast forward, this isn't the end of the lesson. Don't pack it up yet. If we fast forward to the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29, Jesus ends it this way. When Jesus had finished, when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed. They were amazed at his teachings. For he was teaching them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Now, the locals 
who wanted to at least seem to be educated and as a rabbi went about quoting former rabbis had said, Jesus didn't quote the rabbis. But throughout the sermon, Jesus said, Matthew 5, 21 to 22, you have heard, but I say to you, he's saying, don't listen to what these guys had picked up from one another. This is Jesus talking. This is Jesus, the Son of God, talking. And so you have heard, but I say. I'd like to break the sermon down just a little bit. And let's get to one of the parts that all of us really, really love. And it starts with the blessed R's. Now, we call this section of the Sermon on the Mount the Beatitudes. That word does not convey really the depth of what Jesus said when he said, blessed are. And these are found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. And I believe that the statements that Jesus makes here in these blessed R's, in what we call the Beatitudes, are the foundation of what Christ expects his disciples to be. And so there's your first challenge. I would expect that you might even get a little curious, even though you've heard them over and over and over again. And before you go to bed tonight, you at least read through the Beatitudes. The, the strange thing about them, and to me, the glorious thing about them, is that each of them seems contrary to what human nature would say makes a person successful. Do you get that? I find that to be very, very important. See, people have their concept of what makes people successful. For example, uh, if someone drives around in a nice car, they might say, well, this person is pretty successful. Look at the wheels. If a person has a nice house, a really nice home, and if you go into the home and you find it furnished very, very well, you might say, this person must be very, very, very successful. Jesus runs countermand to that. And so if we start in chapter 5, verse 3, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, this goes counter to what uh, people accept. We're not, we don't want to be poor. Now, when Jesus talked about poor, he wasn't talking about people living from paycheck to paycheck. He wasn't talking about physical condition. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. And I believe what he was saying was that we have to become destitute, literally destitute in spirit, or we will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. One in this condition knows that they must have something else to depend upon because their well spiritually is dry. Therefore, with that in mind, because one's works are not going to get someone into heaven, we know that our tank is spiritually empty. Therefore, the second statement that talks about those that mourn, those that mourn over their spiritual condition, are the ones that will be comforted. God looks at them and say, says they're mourning because of this condition. They're spiritually 
empty. These are the ones that I have to fill up. Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. And these fantastic statements go on and on in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the gentle. We must hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus goes on to say his disciples must be merciful. They must be pure in heart. They must be peacemakers. And he closes this section by talking about how people will handle it when they get persecuted. And so Jesus runs the whole gamut of human affairs in a way that the world looks at and would almost shudder at. But Jesus puts it in perfect perspective. And so again, I challenge you tonight, and maybe even during the week, to look at the Beatitudes and see who are the blessed. See if you and I are included in that. If we are the ones that are poor in spirit, if we are the ones that mourn, if we are the ones in the end who know how to handle bad times because they will come to us. Throughout the rest of the sermon, after uh, the Beatitudes, Jesus shows that one's righteousness, and by the way, here's the nugget for the evening. Jesus states that people's righteousness comes from in here. It comes from inside and must not be a show to the world on the outside. Now, if we go back to the beginning and say, Jesus didn't want us to be this, like the scribes and the Pharisees, they were very interested in how they looked to other people, to their prayers, to their fasting, uh, to their tithing. They wanted everyone to know, I'm fasting. I'm tithing. Listen to this wonderful prayer. It will be glorious. All the wonderful words that will be included in it. And we, we know those lessons. They're out there for us. But what Jesus is saying is that someone's righteousness is an inside job. It comes from the inside, not from the outside. Therefore, what the world sees as success, the nice car, the nice house, the nice furnishings, the nice clothes, the nice manicure, the nice pedicure, whatever it might be, this isn't what Jesus is interested in. I'm not telling you, if you can afford to have a nice car, wonderful. If you can afford to have a nice car, it's great. Everybody wants to dress and look okay. That's okay. But these aren't the things that are going to get us into heaven. The things that are going to get us into heaven is those things that emanate from within. And Jesus gives all kinds of illustrations where this must be done in literally all sorts of situations, most of which the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees took the opposite stance. We have to look good in doing what we do so that everybody sees that we're doing it right. And aren't those some wonderful thoughts that we can take with us? The idea of, of running on spiritual empty so God can fill up our tank, that we are literally spiritually destitute 
so the Lord can make us rich? That we actually mourn about this, knowing our condition, so that the Lord will bless us. And so, as we, as we finish uh, this evening, if, if we remember uh, the mountain from where the message was delivered was not real big. It wasn't an amphitheater. It wasn't a place uh, like a, a football stadium that holds 60,000 people. But the message from the mountain was huge. It was the biggest message ever delivered to human beings by Jesus. And it gets to the very heart of the matter by telling us that our righteousness must come from the heart. It must exceed the righteousness of those that think they're righteous. In Jesus' days, like the scribes and the Pharisees, because they were only for outward show. Jesus lets us know that what happens on the outside results from what goes on inside. We do good deeds because something inside us tells us to do good deeds. We visit with people or we send notes to people. We encourage people. We text people. That doesn't come flying out of the air. That comes from a desire within us to be godlike and righteous in our life. It emanates from our hearts because we were spiritually empty and God filled us up. Let's study and obey this great Sermon on the Mount. I would challenge you this evening to go ahead and read the Beatitudes. Put them on your heart when your head hits that pillow. And think about how blessed we are to be children of God. And then during the week, there are five, there are three chapters. Matthew chapter five, chapter six, and chapter seven. It's in, in layman's terms, it's short reading. But it will be the best reading that you can do all week. And so I challenge you, put the Sermon on the Mount on your agenda for the week to listen to these wonderful words that Jesus has for us. Let's all pray together as we end this evening. Our God and our Heavenly Father, I just uh, pray that you would uh, continue to be with us, continue to uh, share our lives with us. We realize, dear Heavenly Father, that uh, we're empty without you. We realize that we, we don't have a, a chance to get to heaven without the saving grace that you have uh, brought upon us through sending your son Jesus to us. Let us constantly remember that Jesus gave himself up that we might live, that our sins are forgiven because of the blood Jesus shed for each of us. Let's all just uh, continue to remember those on our prayer list. I especially uh, ask that you would uh, be with uh, our friend Pat and in her walk, dear Heavenly Father. Bless her and help her to find comfort in her life and especially find comfort in you and comfort uh, from those that really care for us. And please, dear Heavenly Father, help us to show those around us that we do care for them and help us to show that care in whatever way that we can. Continue to bless us. Be with us this evening. Uh, continue to Heavenly Father to comfort us when we need to be comforted and help us to take that 
uh, into our lives and be a comfort to those around us. I pray these things in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. May God bless you all. It thrills my soul to hear the songs of praise we mortals sing.